Welcome to The Banderpod, the brief and bookish podcast of Bandersnatch Books. We're a small press publisher of treasures found off the beaten path for lovers of all that is good, true, and beautiful. I'm Carolyn Claire Gibbons, and I'm talking with my co-conspirators in creativity, Rachel Donahue and Annie Beth Donahue. Today we are just introducing uh, Bandersnatch and ourselves, and I wanted to start with the deep question of how did we get here? <laughs> how did we get here? <laughs> Rachel, you want to start start the story? Sure. Well, Carrie and I met through the Rabbit Room. For those of you who are not familiar with the Rabbit Room, it is a Christ-centered community of arts and, oh, help me, Carrie. Art, story, and song. And song. There we go. So Carrie and I met through the forums like two iterations ago of their website. And I had just started writing and was looking for community. There was a section of the forum for finding people in your area. Carrie was one of the people who responded. And we found out we were going to be attending a local concert pretty soon after that and decided to meet up there. And once we met in person, we said, hey, we need to have coffee together. We met for coffee and it we, just, we were just fast friends. Like that was just the beginning of this hard and fast friendship that has led to all kinds of creative things. That was, that was the very beginning. We started um, a writer's group together. We started hosting writer's brunches in conjunction with Arts Charlotte. And um, I would host here at my house and then Carrie would kind of lead our discussion time. And out of that grew a writer's group, uh, like a critique group. And we used Diana Glyer's book, Bandersnatch, as kind of our jumping off point. Carrie, you want to explain what Bandersnatch is? Yeah. So Bandersnatch is a book about the Inklings. So C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and Charles Williams, etc. The book that Diana Glyer wrote is an examination of how they influenced one another. The title actually comes from something that Lewis once said of Tolkien, which is no one can influence Tolkien. You might as well try to influence a Bandersnatch. A Bandersnatch, to go even (laughs) further back, comes from Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky poem. It sort of works for us on a million levels. Uh, But anyway, in the book Bandersnatch, she evaluates kind of each chapter, different ways that they influence one another, and then gives you tips on here's how you can do what the Inklings did. And so that was how we built our writers group. Now, in that writer's group was me and Rachel and two other gals that we also know and Annie Beth. And Annie Beth, Rachel introduced (laughs) me to through these writer's brunches and other things because, Annie Beth, how do you know Rachel? Rachel's my (laughs) (laughs) sister-in-law. It was very easy for me to attend the writer's brunches because they were at Rachel's house and I lived behind her. Yes. So I just walked over. (laughs) <laughs> very um, convenient <laughs> yes. Oh yes. so Rachel and I married brothers Mick and Brad Brad is my husband, Mick is Rachel's husband mm-hmm. and so beyond our Bandersnatch connection and our family re- relationship we also have a family business so, but that's another story for another time you Bam. hear us mention the greenhouse that's yes, the family business that's the greenhouse <laughs> <laughs> the point being, it was very convenient for me to show up to these events because they were in my backyard. So we had that group for a year-ish, mm-hmm. um, and then COVID hit. All of us had insanity going on in each of our individual <laughs> lives. So we stopped meeting for a while, but then came summertime of 2020, and one of the gals in our writer's group was going to be moving away. So we decided one last hurrah, we'll get together in Rachel's garage in a very hot July. Socially distanced. North Carolina (laughs) summer with the door open and as far apart as we were allowed to be or able to be. At that meeting, Annie Beth, maybe take it from there, we each had work ready, right? Yeah. So I had actually, at that point, I was um, querying agents and um, had actually gotten some requests for the full manuscript from a couple and was seriously considering being agented and and traditional publishing. And you all also had manuscripts in a various state of readiness, some some more ready than others. And uh, I don't know, I, I remember Carrie saying something about 
we were talking about the publishing industry in general. Uh, Carrie saying something about all of us having a variety of skills and how that we could probably have our own publishing company. <laughs> and I think at some point in that afternoon, the the name Vandersnatch Books was lofted as a, that would be a cool name for a publishing company. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so from that meeting, I have a background in communications. So I spend a lot of time thinking about web domains. From that meeting, I came home and immediately purchased a web domain. <laughs> <laughs> for bandersnatchbooks.com. And then I thought, oh, social media too. And so I uh, grabbed the various social media handles in the process. But then I started writing an email. I was writing to Rachel at that point. I knew Rachel much better than I knew Annie Beth. And so I was writing her this email of like, what do you think? Am I crazy to think this? What do you think if we did this together? And do you think Annie Beth would be interested? You know, should we ask her to be involved as well? Sent the email and got a text from Annie Beth moments <laughs> later that said, Twitter just asked me if Bandersnatch Books wanted to be my friend. Are we starting a publishing company? <laughs> yeah, I'm a techie person and, and do techie stuff for other people in my other jobs. And so I am on my computer a lot and have basically real-time access to anything anyone does on the internet. Carrie, Carrie couldn't pull that off without me immediately finding out. That's right. Her response was, yes, Annie Beth should be involved. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's yes, true. We were all in agreement. After that, we had a meeting, like a, a vision casting meeting of what do we want this to be? What could it be? Just daydreaming, putting things up on the board, hammering out our mission statement, which is publishing treasures found off the beaten path for lovers of all that is good, true, and beautiful. Then from there, we just said, okay, we're, we're doing this. And our families were supportive and behind us 100%. And that was the beginning in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we formed as a company in September of 2020. Mm -hmm. Released our, well, we did a Kickstarter for our first book, which is my novel, Rose Fire, in late January and into February of 21. And then that book released in July of 21. And then our second book to come out was Rachel's Book of Poetry, Beyond Chittering Cottage, August, September of 21, somewhere yeah. in there. I had another book in the mix. And then Annie Beth's came out that next spring in the spring of 2022. Let's take a moment to kind of tell briefly how we got into writing, each one of us. Um, Annie Beth, you want to start with a little bit of your story? Sure. I actually um, thought I was going to be a writer like professionally from the time I was probably you know, like eight. So when I was in elementary school, I was writing little books and stapling them together. <laughs> and I wanted to be a writer. And so when in high school, I took all the writing classes. And then I ended up going to something in North Carolina called Governor's School. And I actually went for music because I also uh, have a music background. And while I was there, I went to a college fair the college fair people were like, hey, have you ever heard of music therapy? And I was like, no, I've not. But, you know, it sounds interesting. And then someone convinced me that it was more practical to, be <laughs> to become a music therapy major. Because, and this sort of makes sense, you can like be a music therapist in schools and hospitals and, and nursing homes and places like that. So I, I can see their point. Instead of doing writing, I made a, a turn and I decided to uh, become a music therapy major. And uh, <laughs> but then once I, you know, got into like my career and started working, um, I had some children and I ended up instead of working outside the home for quite a few years, I worked, you know, from inside the home. And it's much easier to do writing related things on a computer than it is to do music therapy on a computer. So I kind of switched back again and started doing writing for businesses and website copy and things like that. So then writing my novel, my middle grade mystery, that was for, that was the fun part for me. So I would do writing professionally for businesses and other people during the day. And then in the evening, I would work on, you know, the fun stuff for me. And um, the first version of the book was actually created as a birthday present for one of my children. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Rachel, how about you? What's your writing background story? Your writing biography? Yeah, my writing (laughs) biography. Wow. I think one of the reasons that Annie Beth and I became friends when we met, like we were dating brothers at the time, and we just had so much in common because I have a background in music, but I didn't officially study music. And Annie Beth had a background in literature, but didn't actually major in it. And so we had overlapping interests and we're, we're quickly friends. And so, I mean, yes, we're family, but we're also really good friends. So I was an English major in college, but when Mick and I met, he was um, a mission student and was headed to um, work overseas somewhere. And w- when our paths aligned, then I started taking um, missions classes and like cultural anthropology and things like that. I was a, I was a dual major, Bible and English. And so as soon as we both finished college, we moved overseas. <laughs> and so we we did that the first dozen years of our marriage. So I got a degree in English and then proceeded not to use it for <laughs> about a decade. Spent a lot of time in language school, becoming fluent in Spanish, um, starting um, a ministry with immigrant populations in southern Spain and doing some work in North Africa as well. We came off the field in 2015 Um, to address some family issues. And I found myself at home um, with three, well, our boys had been through therapy for various um, needs that had just just then been diagnosed. So we came off the field to kind of help care for that. And then our daughter was born in the middle of that just topsy-turvy season. So I found myself just really desperately crying out to God, like, what do you have for our family in this season? Because we were no longer working together in ministry full time. Um, Mick was gone long hours working in the family business, and it was just me at home. I had no margin for finding relationships outside the home or getting involved in any kind of anything. And so um, I think it was the first week of 2017, I took a, a media fast and really just asking God, what do you have for me and the kids in this new season? And he brought me back to my love of literature. It was just, just unstopping a fountain. It just so much sprang out of that. So anytime I would sit down and nurse the baby, I would put down my phone and pick up a book. And the overflow came in writing. And the first thing that came out was poetry, which surprised me because I had never written poetry. I think maybe one two poems spontaneously that weren't assignments for school in the 30 something years leading up to that. And then in the 48 hours after that first poem, I had half a dozen poems and this new passion, like it was, it was life giving and energizing in the season when all of my time and energy was going to caring for the people immediately around me in the four walls of Mm -hmm. my home. And yet I had this vision of, I could maybe one day publish a book to encourage other moms who are in the trenches just like me. And so I wrote all of my poems kind of with that in the in the back of my mind. Like, I want this to be a gift to other moms. And honestly, it was a gift to me in that season. As I began really starting to work on my craft and getting involved in like the Rabbit Room community online, I was looking for community with other writers to, to talk about writing, to talk about craft, to, to work on my skills. And that's what led me to my friendship with Carrie. And yeah, so that's it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think kind of like both of you, words have always been a big part of my story and my journey as well. I remember in, I guess it would have been first grade, my friend Danielle and I writing a little story where she and I went to space and we met aliens named Mark and Mike, who were the two boys that sat at the table with us. Um, um, But yeah, so I've been, I've written stories. I've always been a storyteller, I think, Mm -hmm. and have written stories. And, you know, when I was in middle school, they sounded a lot like Ellen Montgomery got into college and they sounded a lot like kind of Lord of the Rings 
<laughs> you could definitely tell as as you look back at or as I look back at the things that you, none of you are ever going to read them. Um, yep. But as I look back at these things, um, I can tell you know very clearly what I was reading at the time because that definitely shaped how mm-hmm. I would write. I also wound up not immediately going into writing. I went into in missions in Alaska for two years post college. Then I did grad school, and in grad school I was an English uh, did did a master's in English with the thinking that I was probably going to head into publishing. But at that point, the publishing industry imploded following the economy downturn. That was the kind of turning point for me to be like, well, there are no jobs in publishing. So I wound up going into communications and wound up in communications for nonprofit organizations for a decade before meeting you guys. That being and we're so glad my, you did. <laughs> you know, it's useful. It is a useful those, skill those to skills have. Those are very useful. <laughs> yeah. And in that time um, was when I wrote Rosefire, my book. So, you know, it was in that season of not doing publishing and then eventually moving into it with Rosefire. So, you know, our first book is as Bandersnatch. So mm-hmm. it's a pretty fun adventure. Yep. That is the broadest strokes overview of each <laughs> of our stories and of Bandersnatch's story, but we also don't want to take forever. So let's wrap up with just a quick lightning round. I'm going to ask you guys a question and then I'll answer it too. And that question is, tell me a book that is off the beaten path that you love. Mm. Well, I can start with that. So one of my all-time favorite books was a book I read as a teenager. It is Marsha Schuyler by Grace Livingston Hill. Grace Livingston Hill is known for, like, she's kind of the earliest of the, like, romance, Christian romance novels. And honestly, like, I've read ton, like 50-something of her books, which she was a prolific writer. This particular story, Marsha Schuyler, is the beginning of a trilogy that follows three different characters, but their lives overlap. Marsha is the younger sister. Her older sister is supposed to be getting married. And her older sister splits the day of the wedding or the night before. And so Marcia steps into her sister's place and marries the man and then goes off with him. <laughs> and it is it is it is actually a really cool story. He's a journalist. And it's the time when the steam engine is just becoming a thing. And so, you know, you have these his- historical settings. And it has, like, it really rings truer, I think, than any of her other stories that I've ever mm-hmm. read. I heard that it's because this was a story of something that had happened to someone in her family. And um, it still just stands out vividly in my (laughs) imagination. So I think that's that's mine. Annie Beth? I I have two things. I loved books about the famous five, which are by Enid Blyton fairly famous for like the older generation. Yeah. Um, mystery series for 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 children and it was off the beaten path though because by the time i came along it wasn't exactly like in vogue you know mm, right mm-hmm. these are kind of old and i i would find them at like library book sales so you'd go to the library book sale and they're getting rid of all these books because nobody wants them anymore and i'd always look for the famous five mystery series compared to my peers i guess that was off the beaten path for me, because I found them delightful and kind of old fashioned and and they were mysteries and they were fun. And along the same vein, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this book, but it was called The Revenge of Jeremiah Plum. And <laughs> it's a great title. <laughs> it is. And Jeremiah Plum is this ghost that lives in an old crumbling Victorian house. And um, it's a more mo- it's modern. It's not old like the, the famous five series. And uh, this girl, I think her name's Darcy. And there's somebody else in the book. Uh, they come to like stay with their aunt for the summer, run into this ghost, and he wants to find out who who killed him and who murdered him. And um, and then the end is kind of funny. So I'm not going to give that away in case anybody wants to read it. But yeah, so that's mine. I have to find this book. I know. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> it was. 
I'm going to go with Understood Betsy. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> is one that we love and we do hope someday to do a classics uh, edition of Understood Betsy. But I grew up reading Understood Betsy. My mom's mom's name is Elizabeth Ann and the main mm. character's name is Elizabeth Ann. And my mom's godmother was an Elizabeth Ann who gave her a copy of Understood Betsy when she was a little girl. So my, I grew up with mom reading me her copy of um, Understood Betsy that's like from the 50s. And it's about a little girl named Elizabeth Ann who lives very quietly and properly with her aunt and cousin or something along those lines in the city. And Elizabeth Ann has to be sent to live with the Putney cousins in Vermont. (laughs) So she arrives and it's this horrible, you know, leaving these lovely ladies who have coddled her her entire life. Mm -hmm. She winds up with the Putney cousins who are just the best salt of the earth people mm-hmm. and and start giving her responsibility and start asking her to do chores and, you know, all of these things. And mm-hmm. she blossoms in mm-hmm. that environment. It just is a story I have always loved. It's it's one that is a little lesser known than mm-hmm. than others, which is sad. So we want to wrap up. We do want to tell you quickly that this is a bit of a unique episode with the three of us talking. Moving forward, we've had the opportunity to have some really great conversations with authors and with potential authors and uh, with illustrators and artists and just all sorts of people about the world of writing. That's one of the fun parts of Bandersnatch books. And so we want to bring some of those to you in the future. So future episodes, we plan to have just a short conversation on a single topic with authors and with others about books and about writing and about all those sort of things. So we hope you'll join us another time. And until then, may you find bookish treasures in your wanderings off the beaten path. Thanks for listening in to our conversation today on the Banderpod. We hope you'll check out our full catalog at bandersnatchbooks.com. The Banderpod is produced by Rachel S. Donahue, A.B. Donahue, and Carolyn Claire Gibbons. Audio engineering by S.D.G. Morgan. Artwork by Evelyn Warnemendy. Many thanks to our friend Chris Slayton of Son of Laughter for our theme song, Cricket in a Jar. Find links and more in the show notes.